interesting point, sir, that you make about the journeys that people take into industry. And, and I was really enormously moved by the last slide that you showed, which mm -hmm. said, by Claire McGovern, senior consultant. Yes. <laughs> that is, if I can put it bluntly, what we go to school for. It's the most moving part <laughs> of our job for Sarah, myself, and Susan McCambridge, who's our Assured Skills you know, Program Area Manager. When you see people coming back with their Deloitte badge or their PwC badge, and they're coming in to, as Mary Claire has done, to train, to help select the next batch of people going into industry, that's you know that we're really doing something right. But you can look at the term senior consultant and say, oh my goodness, how do you become a senior consultant? You must have gone and done different degrees in IT and so forth, but not every journey is the same. So I have some questions, Mary Claire, but before that, I wonder if you'd be kind enough, Mary Claire, to take us on a, a little journey. Maybe you'd start with your choice of A-levels, which I think is a very interesting one, and take it from there, please. You're very, very welcome. Start with the hardest question, Aidan. So for <laughs> A-level, I studied French, Spanish, and art, and then was also asked to take on a fourth A-level of maths, which we are not going to talk about <laughs> after me mentioning it right now. <laughs> French, Spanish, and math. And when you were, you know, you chose your A-levels when you were doing your GCSEs, and had you an idea of, of what part of the employment sector or industry you wanted to work in, or, or, or was it, you know, thank goodness the GCSEs were over, let's choose some A-levels I like? De definitely not thinking ahead whatsoever. I just chose the subjects that I really enjoyed and did well at. Mm -hmm. um, the, the career counsellor had then advised me to choose maths because you should always have something science based, <laughs> um, which, which turned out to be a bit of a disaster. But yeah, as most sort of 15, 16 year olds do, I wasn't necessarily thinking about the future. I just chose the things that, that, that I knew that I was, I was good at and enjoyed. And I really didn't have any, any further plans aside from doing my A-levels either. Yeah, uh, and I think that's a lovely example. I mean, you've had great success and it is a lovely example. We've spoken recently about, we ran an academy with Microsoft and one of their senior premier field engineers joined us on a call and his story, my, my question is always tell us about your story. So his story was fascinating, which was leaving school, becoming a welder, um, then being made redundant and going back to do the degree that he'd always wanted to do in French. And his professor refusing to accept handwritten essays for the, so at the first time in his life at the age of 30, he switched on a computer. And the rest is history. And I think that's an interesting point. Sarah mentioned the both the Masters in Software Development and also the Assured Skills Academies. We have had every degree coming in. We've had theology, we've had archaeology, we've had uh, um, zoology, um, journalism, English, performing arts, uni as well as all the IT disciplines as well. So, Mary Claire, tell us then about your journey to university, what that was like, please. So having studied mainly arts subjects, uh, I would kind of pigeoned myself into doing an arts degree, which which was fine. And it's what I wanted to do at the time. So I studied Spanish and business and I went to university in, in Dublin. So it's it's a four year course with a year abroad. Um, so it was really learning Spanish through business so I can quite funnily have a, a very detailed conversation about the about the economy and the business sector in Spanish, but could hold a normal conversation with a person on the street. So it, it, it's quite funny the vocabulary that you pick up. Um, but that was that that was it. So and I and again I really wasn't thinking about job opportunities after that. I did choose business because I thought you know that might broaden my horizon slightly but I still wasn't sure exactly what it was that I wanted to do when I finished my degree and just really in enjoyed my time as most students do in university, not really thinking too much about the future either. So there's a bit of a common theme in the <laughs> subjects that I've chosen as I've gone through. Yeah, well, that, that, that's great. Tell it, what part of Spain were you based in for the year that you were away? Just outside of Madrid. So in a little place called Alcalá de Henares. Okay, so let, let, me, let me just throw in my uh, little observation there. Did you go to see a football match whenever you were living near Madrid? No, I actually didn't. I don't know. Shockingly. Really? Well, we'll just move on to the next question. Then. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that you you know that you could explain the offside rule in Spanish or something like that. But well, there, there uh, well, I could give it a go. <laughs> you probably did. You, D Dublin, and not a, not an inexpensive city to live in for for three of your four years. But we'll not we'll not um, remind you about that. So tell us about that. You graduated. 
and you're looking ahead and you obviously you're, you're not afraid of independent learning you're not afraid of traveling you go to another country for another year so when did you start thinking about what followed those four years was that something you started beginning to think about in first second third or your final year well as per the previous trend towards the end of my degree <laughs> i uh, started to think about my options after um, yeah. and i i just genuinely had no idea what it is that i wanted to do i had looked into like management consultancy knowing mm -hmm. that companies like deloitte pwc and others have global mm -hmm. mobility opportunities where you you know you might be based in an office somewhere else or working with clients in different places so so that that sort of piqued my interest and i thought maybe i'd be able to apply you know my business knowledge and and my language skills but i genuinely didn't know what management consultancy was it just <laughs> was a bit of a buzzword um so i i started investigating careers in that regard but i still just wasn't quite sold and i also felt after having studied for four years well having studied for the majority of my adults and teenage life really without a break yeah. but i just wanted to go and do something fun for a while um, so I ended up going and working in Spain as an English language teacher, teaching Spanish teenagers who already had, to be honest, a very excellent level of English, but yeah. just um, teaching them about, you know, colloquialisms and uh, the culture of, of the UK and Ireland. Yeah. Um, and I did, I did that for a few months to sort of put off the, the final career decision yet again. <laughs> So you came back from that. Well, you moved, but you missed the climate in Northern Ireland, right, Clara? So you moved back here from Spain and, and, and did that. So tell us about work here. What did you do when you came back? From, how long were you in Spain teaching English as a, as a TEFL? A couple of months. Okay. A couple uh, of months. And, and did you come back for something to make an application or did you come back just to you know, begin the process of thinking where you were going to take your career? to be perfectly honest i started running out of money because it wasn't a particularly well-paid job but i also wanted to come back and be closer to family um i had considered moving back down to dublin but because of the aforementioned you know lack of money and the the yeah. price of living in dublin yeah. Yeah. Uh, i decided to come back to to northern ireland and, and live in belfast um, and at that point, I sort of realized, okay, well, I need to actually start planning for the future. There weren't that many jobs um, where I could use my, my Spanish language in, in Northern Ireland at that time, at least anyway. Um, so I sort of had to, to rethink and that's where I, I picked up, you know, the, the management consultancy thing and actually started to do a bit of investigation of what, what, what that actually means. But it was a few months after um it was a few months after I had got back that I really started looking into into my options. So there was a bit of a, a downtime, I'll say, between coming back from from Spain and then you know kickstarting my my journey in, into the the world of careers in Northern Ireland. So tell us about that research thing. I mean, how did you you know what was the gap between you returning and you you joining the Shared Skills Academy with Deloitte? And that was twenty. 2015. So how long had you been home before you joined the academy? Uh, I think it was about two or three months. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of um, reading. I did a lot of like researching in newspapers and reading about technology, actually. Um, mm -hmm. at that, I think at, at that time, blockchain was only becoming a thing. And it mm -hmm. was the new technology that everyone was talking about. So I got really interested in it because I could see that there were a lot of applications for it, not just for finance, but also for you know developing countries and improving the, the lives of others, which is something that, that's really important to me. So sort of seeing the, the social aspect of technology rather than just looking at pure details of, of, of tech in itself, but actually the, the wider and worldwide applications of that is where I realized you know, technology isn't just about sitting in a room by yourself with your hands on a keyboard. It can actually have a much greater societal impact, which yeah, is something that was really important to me in terms of, of career. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, we worked with a cybersecurity company recently and, and the lady it was one of their very senior members of staff, she came in and she said to the graduates, you know, the first thing I do, the first thing I want you to do when you go out to a company where there's been a breach is to think about the impact on the person running it. I think of the impact on their relationships with their family and with all you know and take this seriously it's not just you know a plus b equals c think about the human side of that so walk us through the process you heard about the assured skills program maybe you tell us about mind mill and maybe the application interview process before you arrive with us because i think some people it would be very interesting everybody very interested in finding out how that works 
Yeah, so from, from recollection, um, I had to do online psychometric testing, which is sort of a, a combination of like, you might see pictures on a screen and you have to match the words together quite quickly, um, or you have to do, you know, sort of simple arithmetic, which after my maths A level <laughs> should have been a bit easier than what it actually was. Um, but but things like this, where you have uh, time, time-based time responses to understand just, just how quickly your, your brain can kind of process information. Um, so I believe that was sort of the the mind mill section um sure. and i also had to do just just fill in quite a quite a relatively simple application form as well and attach my cv so so to be honest it was it was fairly straightforward um i think you know most people wouldn't wouldn't have 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 difficulty certainly with the application itself anyway okay. which is which is good and interview or information evening how did that work i mean how did you how did you find out more so there was an information evening as well where we all went over to the Deloitte office, had pizza, beer, which is obviously gets um, everyone excited and um, just heard a bit more about the program and what there was to offer. So it was a great opportunity to meet other people who, who, who may or may not have been offered positions on the uh, Assured Skills Academy uh, and also get a chance to speak to some of the people from, from the company, obviously being Deloitte, so that you already sort of could understand a bit about the culture, what the people are like, and realize that they're all just humans too. Um, so, so I thought that was that was really useful. And then it meant um, when I went to interview, uh, it, the manager who did interview me for the position had been there that evening. So we already had that, that rapport, which was good. Um, and the interview was approximately 30 minutes, just asking sort of questions about my background and, and why I wanted to work for Deloitte. A kind of competency-based uh, questions about what you had done, teamed with what you knew about the company. Is that right, or were there other? Yeah, kind of that's questions? that's correct. So mostly competency-based, and then um, a bit about the what you knew about the company and what they did as Very well, uh, and then interests in in technology. Sure, sure. So you 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 got up to speed. Well, the rest, as they say, is history. So you came, uh, you came onto the Assured Skills program, and it, I mean, it's pretty intense, isn't it? I mean, most people think of it. It you know, is. I can, I can think of a postgrad qualification I did where where I drove up to Cool Rain on a Wednesday night, you know, for three hours, and like that was it. You know, I was teaching from time to time, so it was. But this is so. So walk us through that model. It's nine to five, five days a week. It's not easy. Yeah, so it's classroom based learning, which is actually one of the things that really attracted me to the Assured Skills Academies. Um, I know everyone has their own learning style. Some people are really good at just learning by themselves, like watching videos and reading things. For me, I like to hear someone else explain it, get the opportunity to ask them questions and then apply that. And it's through the application of the knowledge that I find that I personally learn, learn in the best way. So yeah, that, that classroom based experience where you have, um, you're in, in a room with a group of people, you have a, a lecturer who's there to support and guide. Um, and, and often, you know, a, a lot of the people working in, in the academies have a lot of business um, acumen and, and, you know, just really know their stuff. So you're, you're working with people who really understand the industry, the job market and, and what's going on with companies in Northern Ireland, which, which was great. So it was that sort of nine to five classroom based um, for the first nine weeks, I believe. And then we moved for the last four weeks into the Deloitte offices where we actually did a project together. So we were in teams sort of competing with one another, which was quite intense, to be honest, um, and applying the information that we'd learned to, to a real world business problem. So acting as if we were actually uh, consultants, consulting with others, asking uh, questions of our sort of pretend client, and then coming up with a proposal over the course of four weeks, um, which was just a great way to apply all of the different things that we'd learned about community communication, team working, and then all of the IT skills that we'd learned as well, and put that against a real world problem. Well, that, that leads rather nicely into the next part of what I was going to talk about, because you're talking there about client simulation, about working with people. Yes, and, exactly. And, and, and looking at that. So let's talk about curriculum, because I, mean, I think that's important, because people can look at that and go, my goodness me, nine to five, five days a week for nine weeks, that's pretty intense, and it is. Um, but it's not just the technical skills, right, Claire, is it? No, definitely not. And that's why the academies are so successful. So you start off by, um, you know, learning about yourself, your own learning style, your communication style, how you work with others, 
which is so important, you know, going into to a job with an understanding of the best way that you can put yourself across to others, how you can work with other people who might have a clashing personality style, um, and then, you know, what's the best way for you to learn. So, so important. And those are the kind of, you know, um, human skills that 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 you're taught over the first couple couple of weeks of the academy and all of that is sort of sprinkled in with with that it based learning so first of all the introductory concepts then you might do depending on the course and um, you might do some some hands-on development but all of it you know really structured in a guided environment with with people that you can ask the right questions to so it's quite good the way you sort of sandwich in those business skills alongside the technical skills to make sure that that you really have that holistic uh, journey throughout the academy and that's absolutely essential isn't it you know in, in that i can think of one very senior person in one of the big four companies that we work with and what drives him on and something he comes back to all the time is can i put this person in front of a client you know, can I put this person in front of a client who has a challenge, who has a difficulty, who maybe needs to change direction? So that business, I had a boss once who used to say the hardest part of any job is not the job, it's the people. It's just getting on with, sharing territory and, and moving on with that. Tell us about then, when, when you're looking at that, so you, you progress that, you liked working in the company. So say somebody's listening to you today, and or they're catching up with you on the YouTube channel and they're thinking about they're thinking about this career in IT. I think it's interesting that you talked about your art subjects at, at A level, uh, your degree about working abroad. Speak directly, Marie Claire, to somebody who's toying with the idea and thinking, well, maybe my skills, maybe my degree qualification, maybe my industrial experience isn't particularly relevant. What would you say? I mean, you're now in a senior role. So what would your advice be? I really think any background that you have is probably relevant to IT. And I say that because we're not just looking in the IT industry for people that are going to be, you know, hands on keyboards developing something. There are such a wide range of profiles that we're looking for. You know, we need project managers, people who are organized and can organize others well. We need analysts who can really dissect information, ask the right questions and structure a response. We, of course, do always need developers. So if that's something that, that you're interested in, that you've never done before or have done before, there's always a need for more people like that. But there are so many other roles that, that sit just outside of those sort of core profiles where the key skills that, that you need to have are communication, probably yeah. leadership skills in some way. So being able to step up uh, and, and help your team working in a team, collaborating with others, and then the ability to, to problem solve. So applying, you know, logical reasoning uh, and questioning um, decisions uh, in, in order to, to, to solve a problem or make a decision. And, you know, regardless of your degree discipline or, or what job you're currently in, it's highly likely that you have at least some of those skills. And if you don't have them all, there's lots of things that you can do to work on them. So ju let's just pick that up. I mean, I was interested in what you're saying there. I'm going this afternoon. We're having a presentation skills competition for our IT apprentices uh, at level three. And uh, we're doing that online. But tell us about the CPD. Tell us about your continuing professional development, because obviously, you know, in the past, maybe people of my vintage would say, oh, thank goodness, I've got a degree. Now I've got a master's. That's me with learning. Well, of course, it's not. So CPD, a big part of your professional development? Absolutely. Um, and that's like some of the best advice that I was given by one of my clients, actually, who was um, in his later stages in, in life, we'll say, but always doing new courses and learning new things um, was that learning is a continuous journey and it doesn't stop yeah. the, the day that you get your job. So certainly in professional services organisations like Deloitte, you're really given the opportunity to learn what it is that, that interests you. Um, there are so many different resources that are available to you and not even just if you work for these companies, but just as an individual, um, like Sarah mentioned before, you know, you can look on uh, LinkedIn, have courses, YouTube, there's lots of resources available to you to help you upskill. And that's something that I personally do or try to do when I have the time, you know, I haven't just done one certification before I joined Deloitte and, that, and that's me done. I'm continuing to upskill, challenge myself and learn new things to make sure that, that my skill set doesn't become outdated or redundant. Mm -hmm. and that, that, that's a brilliant point uh, because uh, we were talking recently with um, Alan Drake from PwC and he's responsible for over 100 qualifications in CPD and one of his colleagues said and that list is going to get longer you know as, as the demands of industry as things change. Uh, Sarah was talking about 
the courses obviously you can have a full-time course like the assured skills or an apprenticeship or something like that but the free at the point of entry the free courses as well the short courses and then the fabulous point that you made Marie Claire about the LinkedIn and YouTube uh, courses I once heard someone who was in <laughs> a strange thing to say who was a stand-up comedian and the advice that he was giving to people who wanted to be stand-up comedian was this when you're not working work on your act so I would imagine if there's somebody not working today, they can work on their professional act in terms of getting into IT by doing an MTA, by doing a LinkedIn course, by doing a YouTube, by listening to Richard Morgan's Inside Business Program and BBC Radio Ulster and following all the companies on Twitter by looking at the Belfast Chamber of Commerce's bulletin every Friday, which is 15 points of light, 15 pieces of really good news. So you can begin to swim in the sea even if you've got no job. Um, you, can, you can start learning. I want to come back to something which is very important to you, uh, which is culture. And I'd like you to tell us about the culture of the company, why that's important to you and how that affects your you know, kind of mood whenever you're working. Well, working for a company like Deloitte, you know, culture is at the pinnacle of, of everything that we do. That's what we're recognised for. That's why people, you know, work for Deloitte and stay there for a really long time. And there's a lot of technology organisations that that have that 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 culture. What we mean by culture is what is the working environment like? Are people su supportive? Are there resources available to you if you're struggling or even if you're not? So things that, that Deloitte are doing at the minute because of the, the current climate are uh, yoga classes, uh, exercise classes, drawing classes for children in the evenings, lots of things to engage the entire family. Right. There's always someone there to, to talk to you if you need. You have career mentors, uh, guides and, and people who will support you. You have sponsors who will sponsor your career and are also just there uh, as, as a, a sort of shoulder to lean on when you need it. And that's, you know, the, the people of the company are what makes a company. A company is not just uh, an organization. It's not just something that exists. It is a living and breathing thing that, that is made up of the types of personalities and, and the, the humans that work in it. Um, and, and that's why I think culture is so important because if you're working in an environment where the culture is toxic or, you know, you don't get the support that you need, it just makes coming to work that bit harder. Yeah. I think as well, I think we can all reflect back on, back in education. You know, if you were frightened in class, if you were frightened to ask a question because you didn't want to ask a daft question, you're not going to learn anything. And that, uh, what you're talking about there, the culture is very, very important. I mean, work hard and be nice to people. Sarah and I knew a company whereby uh, we had a graduate working with them and he was headhunted by another company who offered him £5,000 a year more and he wouldn't move simply because of the culture. He liked where he worked. Uh, and the point he made was, you know, he, in fact, he said he loved where he where he worked. He liked it on a Monday morning, but he loved it the rest of the week. Which is, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And I, I, I remember watching a documentary about BBC Radio 2 and Terry Wogan, and there he was, flicked the microphone on at seven o'clock on the Monday morning, and went, ah, listeners, Monday at last. Now, I don't think anyone's ever going to, I don't think anyone will ever be a season. <laughs> Day Monday at last, but you made a very good point there about that about the health benefits and about your mental health benefits as well, the mentoring and all of that. So the companies that are really switched on and really want to, to help people um, will avoid churn, will keep their good employees, will keep their talent and, and offer them that opportunity to develop. You, you mentioned something which I thought was very interesting about working with and learning from a client, and that leads us into something which which we think is very interesting. People listening to you today. And they look at you and they say, senior consultant, it was very exciting for us to have you back last year delivering on one of the academies. That, that's wonderful. Um, we're listening to you today and you're working with a range of clients and you worked across the globe. What are some of the best pieces of advice that you've been given, not just about your career, but just about you know, the work life balance or uh, looking after yourself or, or enjoying your career? Any Anything there that you think would, would spring to mind? Um... I feel like I've been given so much great advice. It's hard to pick one one particular thing out. So certainly about continuous learning. Um, another about, I suppose, uh, setting boundaries. It's something that's, that's been a really hot topic uh, of conversation for us at the moment. We're working in an atmosphere where uh, your your office and your bedroom might be the same place. 
So it's really important that that you set boundaries and that you respect your own time. It can be really easy just to stay on, you know, on your laptop or, or working until much later in the evenings, just because you don't really have that boundary between your working and your living environment. But actually, you know, closing the door on that room, going and, and taking a walk. Um, you know, if you're if you're on calls, maybe have it, having that while you're out for a walk, just on the telephone with your headset um, just just respecting your own time and setting those boundaries is so important. There are a lot of there are a lot of times where you do have to go above and beyond for your clients and, and you might work slightly after your, your normal working hours. But it's important, especially now that that doesn't become the norm. And I think that's true regardless of, of what interest, industry you, you work in. So yeah, yeah, I think setting boundaries is something that, um, and I think the, the boundaries have become a bit of a gray area at the moment. So it's just yeah. important to sort of reset your thinking around that and then just respect yourself and your own time. And invest in you and, and look after you. And, and, uh, and, and Absolutely. Yourself. You know, that, that's an important thing. I wanted to kind of just, uh, kind of as, we, as we move to the end of our chat, um, and I want to focus on somebody who we've talked about somebody who's in full time employment or we've talked about somebody who's looking for a career change and they might like to think about maybe the shared skills program or doing some MTA qualifications or something like that. I want to go right back and I want to go back to a young woman choosing A levels today, as you were. Um, that person's thinking about a career in IT. What would you say to them about their choice of A levels or extended diploma and FE? What would you say to somebody who's sitting at 16, 18, 21, thinking about a career in IT? So I would say, let's go through the age brackets. If you're 16 and thinking about your A-level choices, probably do better than me and do consider beyond your A-levels, per perhaps. But I think it's also important to know that you can do the subjects that you enjoy and still work in IT if that's that's eventually your goal. You know, it doesn't close the door to you if you do just go with those subjects that you enjoy and, and you're good at. Yeah. It makes it probably a little easier sometimes if you do have that that technical background. But, you know, IT A level isn't for everyone. Neither is games development. Uh, and as I said, there are so many career opportunities with an IT where you don't need to be super, super technical. You just need to be you know a good communicator, for example. Yeah. yeah. For those who are, are in university now and, and maybe haven't studied IT, again, there are so many conversion courses that you can do. There are lots of opportunities for you as well. Um, I, I would say start thinking about it now. Start looking at your opportunities and learn from me and don't leave it until the end of your final year. Um, <laughs> And then for those who are coming from a completely different background, uh, you know, perhaps ha have been, um, you know, su subject to, um, you know, a bit of disillusionment with the current job market, just aren't really sure about about the future of their career, then um, just just having an interest in, in something like technology can be really powerful. So as you said, in you know, listening to, to the news or, or a podcast about it, you know, reading the Sunday, uh, the, the section in the Sunday paper about technology, just to kind of pique your interest in, in what that could mean. And then understanding what opportunities are, are, are available to you as well, because I suppose the key message is regardless of what direction you've chosen, there are so many ways that you can sort of repivot yourself as long as you're willing to, to sort of take on the learning uh, and be open to it. And that's absolutely, I mean, that's really germane, the point that you're making there and that you can hear, for example, something on the radio or you can watch something on CNBC. It's an interesting thing. Um, I was at a talk at the Belfast Media Fest, my industrial experience is in, in broadcasting, not in uh, IT. And I was at a talk at the Belfast Media Festival a couple of years ago, and there was this fabulous woman over from BBC Bristol, their talent manager there called Helen Hagelthorne. And she talked about, you know, going into the media industry. And she said, but, you know, buy a copy of Broadcast Magazine and read it. Um, but she also talked about freezing end credits. Freeze the end credits. So you see somebody who's a director of photography, are they on Twitter? Somebody who's a vision mixer, are they on Twitter? So you're looking at this in terms of you're listening to Inside Business on BBC Radio Austria and you hear somebody from Fincher or Deloitte or PwC, are they on Twitter? Like direct message them, not with, can I have a job or can I have a placement, but really enjoy your contribution to the program. I find it very interesting, full stop. And you might get nothing back, but you might then 
get the radiator turned on in the cold room. And when you go to events, we have a fabulous student here called Stacey Burns, who's now working on, on a film, she's a media graduate, and she got involved in the Royal Television Society and their futures, there are all sorts of careers events. And she went to everything that was going. And the guy that gave her a job on the film said, oh, you're the girl that goes to things. And I thought that was a very <laughs> interesting point because any talk, any careers event, any kind of networking event that, that went, and that was happening. Stacy went to it and the rest is history. She's achieving great things. And the same is true, Mary Claire, what you're saying. There are free, as you pointed out, LinkedIn, um, Chamber of Commerce events, webinars, all of those things. And maybe just asking a question or making a point or following up uh, gives you gives you something which is um, you know, maybe a, li a little bit of an edge over someone else. Definitely um, agree with that. I think the power of your network can't be underestimated. Um, and most of the time, if you do reach out to people, uh, I mean, uh, people are obviously busy, but uh, but a lot of the time, if you have something really specific that you're actually interested in, yeah. you know, people will come back to you and, and give you the answer that you need. And that, that could be that person who then will speak to you the next time that you see one another and, and might be able to, to advise you of a job opportunity that they think might suit your skill set. But what you've talked about there is very interesting because what you've done is established a relationship with that person. Exactly. So it's, not, it's not. It's not cold. It's not cold calling. That like you're actually going to an event, and you you know something about them. You say something which is truthful. You say something which is sincere. I enjoyed your contribution to the Inside Business program about robotics, or I enjoyed your. Uh, I read with interest your article on the Chamber of Commerce website about, uh, you know, whatever that might be, financial technology. And somebody will go, "Oh, that's good. You're interesting. Uh, you're, you're interested in what I'm doing, and you've established that. And then you can." If they want to engage you in conversation, that's fine. And if not, that's fine too. You know, you can you can just get out there. But the past certainly, when, when I go back to when I graduated, I think there was a, there was a feeling that oh, I've got a degree, the world owes me a living. Well, guess what? You know, there are lots and lots, there are lots and lots and lots of of, of, of people with those qualifications. But it's the plus. What have you done? Plus, you worked abroad. Uh, you studied abroad, you actively researched what was going on in industry. And I think that's a very good thing uh, uh, to talk about um, as well. And just one little point that you made about about uh, the master software development. Sarah talked about that. I can think of two people who did that. One had a degree in drama and one had a degree in media. And they did the master uh, in software development. Both did graduate academies with us and both are now full-time employment in the IT sector. So, uh, you know, even if you get to the grand old age of 21 and have a degree, <laughs> I'm sure you can apply. There are lots and lots of routes there. I think your success story is one which is inspirational, Mary Claire. We're enormously grateful to Thank you, you. Uh, for taking the time to chat to us today, to share your expertise. Sarah, I wonder just as, as the, the brains of the operation, as somebody who's put all of this together and brought us together for this chat today, would you have any final thoughts on anything that Mary Claire has said or, or any other points that you think our, our viewers might be interested in? So I think that well, everything that Mary Claire has shared with us today is um, really great advice. So everything, um, it's really starting with um, applying yourself and what's happening in the industry, building your network out and uh, just horizon scanning, seeing what's available out there. It's so important. And, you know, if you if you like Marie Cara, like myself as well, I I was quite quite similar, actually, in, uh, as you, Marie Claire, I was a linguist as well. And I'd ended up working in IT before I joined Belfast Met and the uh, careers teacher at that time told me to do a sense to keep my options open and that really wasn't me. So if you are at that stage choosing, like don't be discouraged, like go with what your gut's telling you. And if you have experience, um, there are still ways and pathways to, to get into the industry and do do reach out to us and uh, we would be we gladly talk to anybody who wants to find out more information. And you could, you could, you can be a little overawed by what you're doing, Sarah. Too modest to say that you worked in the senior position in the, the automotive uh, industry and worked in Iran. I think you visited Iran eleven times. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> and as a, as a woman in management, I think you have some interesting insights there, which we might share on another <laughs> on another occasion. Just a final observation that I had, just about the degree which you come with. Where we had a, a student with a degree, one of the first MTAs. 
The first MTI that I remember taking a group down to Titanic Quarter to do, the guy who got the highest mark in the group, I'll never forget this, was Networks, and his degree was in zoology. <laughs> and we had a student just this year who's now working in the industry and in, in fintech, and uh, her degree was in theology. And we had, a, we had a bit of a giggle about that with the lecturer who said, hang on a minute, somebody who can translate Greek, Greek and Hebrew will have no problem working their way through a set of <laughs> <laughs> so Every qualification, every experience. And I think just in closing, what Mary Claire talked about is you can develop it full time and you can do it with very little time and you can do it with absolutely no money. So some of these courses are free. Networking is very often free and qualifications you can pick up. Uh, are free with Belfast Met. So reach out to us uh, on behalf of everyone at Belfast Metropolitan College. Uh, may I thank you, Mary Claire, for sharing your expertise with us. You've been enormously generous with your time. Your thoughts have been inspirational for which we are most grateful. Um, and Sarah, we thank you very much for putting this together, for bringing us all together to celebrate the success that people can have in an industry which provides wonderful rewards and great opportunities. So thank you, Mary Claire. Thank you both for having me. Honestly, it's been great. Always good to catch up. <laughs> you, you have been wonderful and uh, an inspirational presentation today. Sarah, thank you very much indeed. And thank you everyone for following us up, uh, for following us today. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you all very thank much. You. Thanks all. Bye-bye.